Our world is lost in unnecessary fear and hurt. Our systems seem scientifically engineered to make you small, powerless, and always waiting for the next great leader who will fix the problems around us. Worse, we're witnessing neighbor versus neighbor while warfare breaks out around our family tables. But you have access to a spirit, a strength that enlarges and empowers you. Even better, you don't need to wait for the next big movement. You can heal the world. It's time for governance by grace. Welcome to Grace Archy with Jim Babka. You know, it's been a long time, but I should just say it. Here's Johnny. Right? He's back. John Stewart is with us again, and there is something that his critics just don't get, but Jim does. So we're going to do this episode and in four points. Jim's going to lay chapter and verse on you for what's up with John Stewart these days. Hey, Jim. Hey. Uh, so, you know, John Stewart's back. He's doing a once a week episode. The Daily Show used to be, well, daily. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> now it's now it's not a daily show anymore. It's a weekly show called The Daily Show. Branding is everything, right? So uh, he's back, and he is showing why he was the best that ever had this seat, because uh, other people have had it, and other people have guest sat in it while we were waiting for him to come back, and he's showing everybody why he was the best at this job. And I, I'm saying this as someone who doesn't agree with his politics. Like, I don't agree with John's politics. But he has this thing that he does. And so it's interesting. I, I want to start off by laying out the fact that episode one, which was a couple of weeks ago, um, he got the the harpies on the view shrieking, and not just those harpies. The, the the ones he got the harpy Keith Olbermann shrieking, and Mary Trump shrieking, and a whole bunch of other people because he actually had. I, I, by the way, I just want to say, just as an aside, I don't. If there's a video online that says the view did or the view responded or so and so has this take on the view or the ladies of the view thought this other, I don't. These are clickbait Karens. I do. I never, ever watch it. I just won't. I refuse. I already know it's not going to make me happy. It's not going to edify me in any way. I just don't click it. So I haven't watched. I, in fact, I haven't watched John's full segment on this. I'm going to be completely open and candid about it because watching any moments of The View doesn't work for me. I won't put it in the show title because I don't want you clicking on anything that says The View. I just don't want to encourage that behavior. But... uh. In the first episode, John talked about Joe Biden's age, and that's borderline uh, disinformation or malinformation. It's probably malinformation, right? You can't talk about his age because there's a bigger threat out there. And even if he doesn't know that he's the one that could press the button uh, to put us all in nuclear Armageddon, he shouldn't. You can't question it because the alternative is so much worse. Uh, and so the whole Trump derangement syndrome crowd really got upset with him for talking about something that was as obvious as the nose on my face right now. And they they kind of went after him and then flip it over because the next week he took on the explicitly anti-libertarian Tucker Carlson, Tucker Carlson, who goes over and interviews uh, his new favorite politician. Uh, Putin. And, you know, listen, he asked some real journalist questions of, of Mr. Putin. He did actually throw him some fast pitches during the course of that interview. However, he was extremely gullible and he spends time going in and talking about how much better it is and how much cheaper it is to live in Russia. Overlooking, as John Stewart pointed out, the fact that you also make a whole lot less money and these services that are so wonderful cost a far larger percentage of your income than they do well, for, in the United States. The messy the United fact, States. You can't speak your mind without fear of death. So I he mean, did. I, to Tucker's credit, he did ask a question about involving a journalist, a Wall Street Journal journalist that's there. He did press it. And he did actually challenge Putin that this is what journalism is. Right? So... But, you know, Putin knows the score, right? I mean, he's holding Snowden over. He's got Snowden. He's protecting Snowden over there from us. He knows what our government's doing to uh, Julian Assange. So, yeah. you know, it's not like Joe Biden, can, you know, who's calling, you know, uh, Putin a crazy SOB or whatever. It's not like, you know, he really he, he lives in a glass house that he's from which he's throwing rocks at, at Putin. Putin's really bad. 
And, and this is interesting to me because now I want you to notice the dynamic here. Uh, John Stewart's a liberal. Okay. He's on the political left, but he, he doesn't hesitate to point out what's wrong on their side and then comes back and does the same thing on the right, which is not how other people have occupied that seat or any of the late night talk shows have done. They haven't done it. And it's even more interesting to me because it's, it feels like a flashback. You know, John Stewart got out of the chair from behind the mic, got off the show right before Donald Trump came in and ran. It's gone nine years, right? He's like, I I'm out. I'm out guys. And then Donald Trump shows up. And at the time, I don't know if you recall this at the time they were saying it's something's really wrong with American democracy because most people are now saying they get their news from the daily show. Do you remember what the crisis that's, this was the crisis. This was, nobody knew that they were supposed to be mad at Facebook yet. That hadn't happened yet. Nobody knew that they were supposed to be mad at Twitter or now at Elon Musk. Nobody knew that they were supposed to be mad at these other things. John Stewart was the threat because it wasn't serious news. And, and so uh, all of a sudden he comes back after nine years and the shrieking begins, right? Oh my gosh, there's this thing called the daily show. Are, are people going to be getting their news from there now? You know, like it's this brand new phenomena. I, I think it's kind of funny. I got to tell you, I, I appreciate Comedy Central because they're able to give me that third way. Yeah. The well, left and the right don't. All it is is fairness. So now the, the, the Trump derangement syndrome crowd literally has come up with a label for this. Uh, they call it both sidest. That was Keith Olbermann's neologism for it. Or both sides are the same uh, rhetoric was another way that they put it. They're right. So stuck in dualism, man. It's just never Yeah, they think up. that there's this false moral equivalency going on on John's part. And if he were truly an enlightened comic, he would only make fun of one side because the other side is the be clearly the better side. And that's how this works. Right? And I'm here to tell you that they're both wrong. In fact, John Stewart has a secret. And... I can share this secret with you because I've talked about it so many times. I've even given it a name. I've written an entire article about this. Um, you've heard me mention it many times. You it's have a guess better, what it is? It's better than both sidest, right? Yeah. That one's it's just a tripper. tripper. Yes. It's the <laughs> conflict machine. It's the conflict machine. So let's define it for just a second. Let's explain what it is. The conflict machine is a better name for our politics. It's a much more colorful, descriptive name. There are the participants, the operators, the owners of the machine want to draw you into conflict with your neighbors. They're able to do this because they have the mechanism of coercion. That is, if, they're, if the bad side wins, they coerce all of us good people. But if we win, we get to taste the delicious tears of our enemies. And this is the conflict that is ongoing. Now, here's the key thing you need to understand about the conflict machine. Some people, when I've said this in the past, will say, oh, yeah, winners and losers. There's no need for any winners in the conflict machine. Yeah, None. That's the fun part about it. There have to be losers. Someone has to be gotten at the expense of. Someone has to have their happiness or their prosperity diminished. That is absolutely required in this, okay? And that, and then we, this is held up as a means by which, and nobly, we will solve social problems or protect, provide national security or whatnot. Oh, but the sure truth of the matter is, is at the end of the day, every one of these questions resolves down to a political question. And that question is, who will have the power? Will it be your side or the other side? And in the process of this game that gets played, People become so obsessed with the winning of it, of the making the other side cry part, that they forget what it is that motivated them to want to be involved in the first place. So the entire sum of the game is conflict. It's ridiculous conflict. It's dis, it's it's the reduction of harmony. It's more conflict, right? And it's it and doesn't then, really serve. I mean, it's just conflict for conflict's sake in many yes. ways. So, John may not have these wor this word, he may not know it, um, but he has an intuitive sense. I, I have this hypothesis, Bill, that our best comedians are our true geniuses. These are guys oh. that just, they see things that nobody else sees, and they come up with a way to sum it all up and make, it, make us laugh at it 
which is no easy feat. Throughout history. Uh, yes. Mark Twain, uh, yeah. up to George Carlin. Yes. This is just, the, this is this is genius level stuff, right? That they yep. have this level of insight. And I'm not saying every comedian's a genius. So I want to be clear. There's some dumb ones out there, right? I'm talking about the fact that there are people that are able to kind of sum things up and wrap them up in a package and make the absurdity of the thing so obvious to everyone. They, they're able to take the blinders off that all of John Stewart's critics have on. Right. Because they can't the see the right sticker, there. Right. You, you take the blinders off and you can see the picture, the whole picture, you, just, you know. Right. So John Stewart's solution is not mine because he thinks, well, it'd be kind of cool if there'd be some better government people in it. George Carlin, on the other hand, said, no, you know, we should have the meteor come and blow this whole thing up. You know, we're, we're basically screwed. Let's enjoy the journey. Let's enjoy the absurdity of it because the absurdity ain't going away. Uh, yep. John Stewart believes that the absurdity can go away. Like he's going to hold up a mirror to it and be a critic of the system. Right. Um, but uh, I, I get, I, I still see him as being way far ahead of all of his critics in being able to see the fact that this, this system is patently absurd. It is built on absurdity and, and, and that the conflict machine is just robust and, and operating. Like he gets this thing. Now, the real solution to the conflict machine is we need to stop. Like we don't need to do this. It's grace. Every social problem that you can possibly think of can be solved through voluntary means. Every social problem that you can think of can be addressed by starting with a, a, an ethic of tolerance, an ethic of openness, an ethic of forgiveness, an ethic of steel manning the other side and trying to figure out what it is, where they're coming from, what their true concerns and problems are, and then trying to work out solutions amongst us. Everything can be done better that way. The conflict can be pulled completely out of it. And the proof happens every day in our day-to-day -day lives with the people that we have relationships with. We find ways to get things done to create harmonies of interests. And that's a much better solution. But in the meantime, it's still kind of fun to watch John Stewart laugh at it. Oh, absolutely. And the fact that he can find a way to sum it up and make it funny, he and his writers can find that spot and point out the absurdity. They're not making a moral equivalency argument aside from the fact that everybody there is trying to start conflict left and right. That's all they want is to defeat the other. That's all they really want. And so he can play with that. Okay. Uh, I want to, I want to make one more point before yeah. we go. I want to throw in one more bonus because it, his second episode is about Tucker Carlson and John Stewart and Tucker Carlson have a very important, significant historical intersection with one another. It is the greatest episode of Crossfire ever, and it was the meteor that killed that dinosaur of a show. Now, sitting in Crossfire was a show that started with CN, at CNN. It was an original show from CNN. It was like in their very earliest days, they had this debate format show. And here's how it worked. Bill, you might be on the political left, and I'm going to be on the political right. And we're going to invite two guests on, uh, one from the political left and one from the political right. And we're going to crossfire. That means we're going to interrogate the guest who is opposite our political view. And so, you know, I'm going to switch your role here. I'm going to make you the guest right now. And I would say, you know, something like, Bill, you know, I understand that liberal Democrats only want to, you know, beat their wives and their dogs. And I want to know when you're going to stop doing that. And then you would come back and say, well, it's so good of you to say that because you have actually taught me how to beat, but we decided not to do it. And this is how the whole thing would go, right? Yeah. It was theater in the nth degree. Very little. It was much more heat than it was actual light. And it was actually the participants were kind of laughing the whole the whole way through it because they all knew that they were participating in theater. In fact, it was, can you elevate a burn to a new level? Can you come up with a zinger that will knock out the other side? That was the whole thing. It was quite literally the conflict machine turned into a party game. Yep. It was a great show. Now, John Stewart comes on. And he's the guest. Paul Begala. And Tucker Carlson, and because John Stewart was so big at the time, and this is Gulf War era, this is you know the mid uh, aughts. Because John, I'm sorry, the Iraq War, excuse me, the Iraq War era. Because John Stewart was such a big celebrity, they didn't crossfire him. They decided they would co-interview him. And initially, it was going to be kind of like softballs. So Paul Democrat Paul Begala, bow tied Republican. Uh, John Stewart, 
I we're going to have to put this in the show links, uh, show notes. You have to watch this because it is one of the greatest takedowns of anything ever, all time. So John Stewart comes on, and the first thing he says, guys, um, I, I just I came here because I, I just I'm okay. Like on behalf of the American people, I I just want to say, just just stop, please please stop. Can't we like can't we get along, right? And they start getting upset, and especially Tucker gets a little bit exercised as this is going, tries to insult John. John, of course, is completely ready for this. He delivers a joke about Tucker's bow tie. That is, I'm, I'm laughing just thinking about it. Uh, but the point was he basically explained to them that they provided no valuable public service, that they simply encouraged the conflict, right? This is how I know he knows the, the concept, even if he's not able to put a name on it the way I do. And even if he doesn't quite get the definition as precise as it do, he has been operating at this genius level with this concept and he took down the show. Yeah. Uh, here's the punchline. Okay. This is amazing stuff within like two, three weeks. It wasn't long. They canceled crossfire. CNN terminated the show and never brought it back because John Stewart stood there and he was the meteor that came in. Now there might've been other factors at that moment, but he completely unmasked that show and did us a huge public service. Now, I salute him because I was inspired by this action. At the time that it happened, I was so inspired. I was invited to come write at a blog that no longer exists. I wrote there for a few years called Positive Liberty. Had some great crew of guys that I worked with there. Uh, and I would submit my columns. And I just had a lot of fun with them. And I'm still friends with a couple of three, three of these guys on uh, on Facebook. Um, and, and I would close every column with the phrase hardball Delenda est uh, based on the Carthage must be destroyed of the Romans uh, in, from the Roman Senate days. I would say this hardball must be destroyed because hardball was kind of the intellectual, as it were, <laughs> loosely used uh, descendant. It was another conflict driven show. And much of what goes on uh, on sports uh, television, much of what goes on on um, financial television, like if you're watching CNBC or something, uh, much of everything that goes on in the political stuff, it's it's conflict driven. But these two shows to me were the hallmark worst of it. And before I knew how to put words to my value, I would close every single column with hardball Delenda asked. So I celebrated when that show was canceled and taken off the air too. It took a lot longer. Um, but our, oddly, there is also an episode floating out there. Uh, Matthews comes on his show, and he thinks, I'm going to get a bunch of softballs, a celebrity interview. I'm going to come on, and I'm going to joke around with John and tell him how much I admire him. And his book, Chris Matthews' book, was about learn life lessons from the, from politicians, how to live a life and be successful by mirroring politicians. Like, do you want to learn how to win and get what you want from the likes of Lyndon Baines Johnson? Read Chris Matthews' book, right? And once again, here's John Stewart. This time it's his show. And he says, um, gosh, what a dark little existence you have. Th this is what you think is good and virtue. This is what we should emulate. Like again, but he did it with comedy. He, he dressed it down and Chris Matthews didn't know what to do. Again, he unmasked. Now it didn't result in the cancellation this time. He didn't kill another show. Can't claim credit for this one but it's the same playbook he's bothering borrowing from. So I know that even if he can't put the exact word to it, John Stewart's show gets his entire premise. The way he attacks subjects gets the conflict machine. And we will give you a full complete detailed description of the conflict machine. I wrote an entire article about it uh, for the now defunct, the exit network 10, which is how Bill and I met. Um, but I will share that uh, also uh, in the show description so you can begin to digest and you can start sharing this idea and you can be as brilliant as Jon Stewart.